Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum and our National Design Week. And welcome to the masterclass with Mary Ping and Joe Doucet. Uh, my name is Kim Robledo Diga. I work in the education department here at Cooper Hewitt. This Winter Salon program is part of our National Design Week, which was launched in 2006 in conjunction with our National Design Awards. And during National Design Week, we offer uh, week-longs worth of free programs that focus on the work and vision of our National Design Award winners, um, which is fantastic. And this is actually kind of tail-ending our week that we've hosted so far. Um, but before we get started, I want to thank our, our sponsors and funders. National Design Award programming is made possible by generous support from Target. <laughs> Additional support is provided by Adobe. And funding is also provided by Design Within Reach, Altman Foundation, Facebook, Edward, Edward and Helen Hintz, and the Siegel Family Foundation. So let me welcome Matilda McQuaid, who's a Deputy Curatorial Director here at Cooper Hewitt, who will introduce our National Design Award winners to you today. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Glad you're here, and especially in this beautiful room here. It seems like this is a well-designed room, and uh, with the sun beaming in. So I have the great pleasure of introducing Mary Ping and Joe Doucet, who um, you will hear a little bit more about in terms of their installation in the show just behind you called Tablescapes, Designs for Dining. Um, they had a, a major role in that exhibition. Mary Ping is a designer and founder of Slow and Steady Wins the Race, and as Kim said, that she was the um, National Design Award winner last year in fashion. Um, her conceptual clothing and accessories line investigates the elements of what people wear, how they wear it, and why. Joe Doucet, um, again, a National Design Award winner um, last year in product design, He's a designer, entrepreneur, inventor, and creative director who has worked in product, furniture, environment, and technology. So welcome to you two, and I wish you a happy conversation. <coughs> Thanks for yeah, coming. Yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, so that's Mary. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Joe. <laughs> just to make it clear. <laughs> uh, so just, you know, by way of a brief introduction about, uh, you know, how we'll handle this talk. Um, you know, we, Mary and I, you know, put our heads together and we thought, you know, what's the best use of, of, of your time with us? And we thought it would be really interesting not just to get, like, the PR press story about, you know, this exhibit and, and our contribution, but actually for you to hear, like, a lot of the real process that you go to when you get a call saying, hey, we're going to do an exhibit, would you like to participate? Uh, so we'll, cover, we'll, we'll sort of talk about the early stages and our, how we came up with our concept. And then we're actually going to take all of you and walk back to the room so you can actually see the objects that we're talking about so that when we're talking about them in detail, it's not just theoretical and you're trying to imagine what the hell we're saying. You can actually see them right in front of you. Uh, and, and that might lead to a richer conversation that we can have about you know, actual questions that you might have. Uh, so you know, we're, it's our goal to be you know, very transparent and, and very open and sort of peel back the curtain and allow you into the process that, that we went through, which is probably typical of, of what an exhibit like this takes. Exactly. Um, and I think, and then w this way we can s spend more time in the room um, speaking about the, um, the process itself for the table and the seating and the serving ware. Um, this way you can see it right in front of you. Um, so we'll talk now more about the, this is really <laughs> echoey, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. Um, so we can talk a more here about just the I, the sort of nebulous amoeba-like thinking process that led us to sort of the more firmed up um, thing that you'll see in the first room. Um, so when Cooper Hewitt um, invited us um, a few months back, we decided like, well, okay, we'll sit down, have a conversation first, like kind of concept the ideas I think um, I mean for me I'm not entirely sure with you but it's like you know it's just kind of a conversation and then just I we just you had a great actually suggestion which was like divide and conquer so it was like um, Joe was gonna take the serving ware and then I would do the um, tables and seats and so um, but in the bigger umbrella picture we were saying like well we both know like we're 
confident in knowing how to design something that looks good. Um, and so that doesn't, but that doesn't really address anything current, like, meaning like, for me, like, you know, if adding something that just looks nice is easy, but it'd be better to kind of solve a, another problem. And so if we were gonna address the contemporary age, we thought like, well, what does that look like in 20 to 30 years? Okay. You know, the idea of dining. Um, Should I step back? It, it sort of the, 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 um, yeah, the overall, when we were approached, it's actually the, the, the framework of the exhibit mm. wasn't really set. Mm -hmm. um, in case you're not aware, the exhibit of Papalscapes is basically showcasing design right. and dining throughout the centuries. Um, you know, the feature is this Satu, uh, which is from the 19th century, I think done for Napoleon III. Mm -hmm. They had a room de dedicated to the 20th century. And, uh, you know, the curators at the museum invited Mary and I to look at, you know, what's the, 20, what's the 21st century room going to be? Um, there was right. really no brief beyond that, not like, you know, what are you doing contemporary? Is mm -hmm. it about the future? What are you going to do? So, you know, <coughs> Mary and I were sort of thrown into it and we had to very quickly decide, like, put in a point of view about what mm -hmm. just what we were even going to do. Like, what, what kind of program were we going to put on? Uh, there was no specific brief of what type of object or any any type of setting, which is um, kind of typical. And you know, it's a, it, it's kind of interesting because you know, knowing that, uh, I think you know how open it was. You you think that as designers, you love a really open brief, but sometimes you just want to know what you what you need the problem you need to solve. So we you know we had to both define the problems that we were going to address and then come up with a, a solution all in a, a very, very short time. Yes, that, that was the, uh, I think we did a good job, but <laughs> um, but I think that sometimes that, like, you know, those sort of like, you know, like lighting the fires that definitely lets us like, you know, think of, you know, certain ideas and like um, solutions. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, and so then um, on on that note, we, we had a conversation we had lunch. We had lunch, <coughs> uh, we th which was fitting because we were like, we might as well be eating if we're going to be talking about dining. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, one of the options was, you know, going to a boat, and you know, maybe that would inspire something else. But, um, but yeah, we had lunch, and we talked about um, the. I mean, I think the importance of addressing it on a global um, point of view too. You know, I think it was really easy to think about. You know. Um, you know, a place setting where there's like a fork and a knife, um, and then it was important to include like, well, we should say chopsticks, and um, you know, what what does like the rest of the world like? How do they eat? And you know, um, what's you know, what are the actual components when you sit down to the table? Right. And, and um, so these were kind of things that we knew about. Like, okay, well, this is the, these are the obvious points, and then we thought. Okay, well, you know, um, the UN has a projection that in actually less than 20 years, 15 years, there's going to be an additional 1 billion added to the population. Um, and the, you know, the most populous countries now are the US, China, Japan, India. Um, but then that's going to shift in, in 10 to 15 years where it's going to be, um, you know, Bangladesh and Pakistan and, um, and what's, um, as a side note, what I f always find surprising is that like uh, a country as big as Russia is, is barely even on the top 10 list. Wow. <laughs> you know, they're really not that populous. So, um, which is actually um, a good testament to how um, congested everything is going to be because there is gonna be migration into um, cities and because that's where all the jobs are gonna be. Um, so then we address right. that, you know. Yeah, it was <coughs> it was really this an understanding of the challenges that are in the 21st century, right? You have populations that are growing at a very steady rate uh, in a way that is going to lead to greater, far greater congestion, far more limited resources uh, in terms of both material and land and space, uh, and you know resources that we don't really have much of a concern for, like potable water, um, which are going to be more and more um, 
precious in a sense that, uh, that what we have to do is what we decided very early on, we're going to address these issues. We're going to take them head on uh, in terms of, you know, because how that's going to impact your daily life. And, you know, one thing we all do every day is we eat. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what, what can we do in terms of utilizing, you know, our skills as, uh, as designers and creative thinkers and making and, and, and taking those limitations and making them opportunities you know, to have a, a, a better and brighter solution, not this dystopian future um, that we're talking about right now, but these are just problems. We're problem solvers. Like, how can we take those and, you know, use them as a, as a starting point to offer up some solutions uh, that not only, that, you know, that don't, you know, you don't get bummed out when you're walking out of here, but you're like, you know, design can, 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 can make life better in very small ways. And I think that's one of the things we really set out to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll, we'll just like talk a little bit about like some of the iterations or just like the open thinking process that we arrived at before um, what you see in the in gallery. Um, I think, I mean, up front, I think Joe was like far more, you know, like like the perfect student because like you already knew what you were gonna do. And I remember the renderings were like already like perfect, <laughs> and so um, and I had a few sketches that were different than what was out there. So you know, my initial thinking was like, well, maybe it's like a, you know, I I knew I wanted to tackle something that was like the idea of like, okay, well, it expands from a one person to an eight person, you know, which is actually what um, Joe's servingware does. Um, it's multi-purpose and it's um, you know, can can be used for you know one person to eight people or right. infinite. I mean, I think that's actually a nice uh, contrast. Is like we know that we're dealing with something that's finite um, as these parameters, but so what if we were to kind of think of it in infinite terms? Right. You know, and um, <coughs> you know, we we want to make sure we have a lot of time to be to you know a brief time to explain our projects while you're looking at them and open up enough time for you to be able to ask. Uh, you know, questions or, you know, even even raises concerns that maybe we haven't even thought about. Mm. Um, so now might be a good time to head back mm. uh, and we can discuss the, which, you know, the bus is a right, just kidding, it's right back there. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> and uh, that'll give us enough time to, to, to be able to discuss these things in detail yeah. and uh, save room for questions. That sound like a plan? Yeah. All right, yeah. And is it for Indy? I think that we'll talk about the table and you know a few other items that she designed. It's a really, and I hope you 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 know you'll 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 find time to to do it beforehand. Uh, but you know my contribution uh, to this, along with Mary, was basically the what we're calling the tableware and the cutlery. And just looking at it, it's a little deceptively simple. But the problem we were really trying to solve was, okay, what do we do with limited resources? Material and in terms of, you know, the, the, the potable needed in order to clean between stages. So you have cooking vessels, you have serving vessels, you have vessels that you eat off of, and you have, you know, some type of vessels that you store food in, right? So for, for every meal you have, there are essentially four different components that not only take up resources in terms of making them and their manufacture, but I think equally important, they take resources in terms of using clean water to clean them in between each stages. So our thought was pretty simple. Set of vessels. And serve, and eat, and store in those very same vessels. It's a very simple idea, and probably not the most original in the world, but um, we, the, the approach we took was we narrowed down to all the forms that we thought you would need and made them just as simple as possible. And so what we did uh, as, uh, as part of that was to try to make have function and a, and a long bowl and a lid and a glass. And that's it. Uh, but a plate, the fact that the 
becomes a trivet, the fact that the bowl becomes a heating element to contain it, or the bowl becomes a bowl means that you need far fewer vessels in order to be able to service. And we've tried to show a lot of different scenarios here about how they affect. They're just done in, in different uh, aspects. Uh, equally, raised dots. Um, now, why are they? Well, if you're going to cook in something, uh, you know, you're, you're inducing heat into it. Without getting too technical, what we've created are a series of heat sinks. What heat sinks do is they create a greater surface area on one side as opposed to the inside. Now that makes things cook much more quickly with less energy uh, and heat evenly better. But most importantly, after you heat the microwave, they'll quickly dissipate heat so that these things become cooler to the touch. Because if you are cooking on a frying pan and put it in your table and expect me to eat out, to actually go straight from a very hot surface to a very cool surface. But more important, like, we're people. Um, <clears throat> we, if we could take this, this technical necessity and make it into a beautiful aesthetic moment, you know, so that it becomes, it adds, a which is equally, if not more so, important to your enjoyment of, you know, dining, whether it is by yourself or whether it's in a group, you know, people need beauty. It's, it's why you see these dots. There's sort of two. Um, we're a much more globalized society. Um, there are we set that universal, and uh, you know integrating things. You know in between, like you know uh, uh, an eastern spoon and a western spoon, integrating chopsticks. Uh, but what you'll see here is this is a very right hand friendly set. Right, if you're a left handed going to be very difficult for you to use. Where you so whether you're a child, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a the digital file is merely mirrored and you actually have the perfect set of cutlery for you to use if you're left-handed and the perfect set of cutlery for you to use if you're right-handed. So these are simple innovations that technology allows because unlike traditional manufacturing, you're not having to cut tooling and make 100,000 units before you make your cost. When you, you know, click to order on, on Amazon, you're ordering your set, you can just dial in what you want and then it would come in the mail and you got it on the spot, perfectly suited to your needs. Uh, so, you know, it, that's a very, you know, cursory explanation of, of what you're seeing here, and you may have questions later, but I think I'll let Mary uh, talk about, you know, the, her ingenious table here. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, so I, so in order to kind of uh, maintain the conceptual integrity of our sort of mission statement, um, the table and the seating really addresses the idea of like finite space, which I think a lot of us living in you know, New York, you know, in the, the cosmopolitan region definitely um, probably have, you know, have grappled with. And so, um, quite simply, the idea is if you could, um, if you have like one person, you know, um, yourself, or if you have guests, it could accommodate your guests as well. So, um, this is just a, a prototype for display, but in theory, um, the idea is that they spin out of the two central axes, which are based on um, a Lazy Susan. So those spin, and um, kind of the quintessential Lazy Susan is great because you know you can pass food around really easily, and it's a nice idea of like gathering everyone together. So the tabletops actually um, are at different heights for a reason because they 
can stack. And so then the seats fold in and they live underneath the tabletops. Um, so in theory, you know, you could have a um, you can have it on two legs and it will support two people or one person and then you can spin everything out and you'll have up to eight in this iteration. And so, um, so that's the kind of like structural design. The materiality of it is also um, very key because the surface laminate, actually the whole top board that you see um, is a material called rewall based out of Iowa, and they recently got acquired by a company called Continuous Materials. And so their mandate is that they um, are going to try to scale up this existing interior wall board that they supply, um, which are actually compressed, in this case, compressed Starbucks um, coconut water cartons. And so, um, but yeah, and so, and you'll see, if you look closely, you'll, you'll see the sort of like packaging details, and then the silver is, is great because that's the liner, the tetra liner of these um, containers. And so it kind of really gives a second um, new life to things that are um, discarded. Um, and so they, it's a great company and they kind of, you know, um, gather everything based on color. So at least you have some sort of like uniformity and, and I think the nice effect that it um, lends itself to is this idea of like a terrazzo stone um, effect. And, um, the, in this prototype, the M, we used MDF, but um, in our kind of like dream world, it was going to be used, um, we were going to use Rich Light, which is also another 100% architectural material. And it's so, um, somehow the method that they use, they've compressed it so um, densely that you actually have to use a stone cutter to use it. So people have been actually replacing it um, as their, kitchen, you know, uh, counter, yeah, it's, it's great, and it looks, it looks beautiful, but, um, so that was, that was our ideal sort of, like, you know, use, um, and, yeah, so I think this is just, like, a, a potential answer to the idea that, um, you know, you, you don't have enough space in your living space, but you want to try to accommodate everyone, um, how do you do so? The, what you're seeing here are look prototypes. These are 3D printed polymers. This I wouldn't eat off of. Uh, <coughs> but they are designed and developed to be used uh, in 3D printed aluminum, 3D printed steel, and 3D printed glass. Uh, all of these, uh, 3D printed steel is actually commercially viable at the moment. 3D printed glass is in its nascent stages. Uh, to be, you know, we're told it's going to be commercialized in three years. I give it 10. Uh, but uh, so this is, you know, not today's solution, but in the very, very near future. So, uh, no, I bet you could buy them from the museum, though. <laughs> Get some extra funding. Yes. Right. I, uh, in terms of color, I think what we were looking at was to create some you know, contrast between the two. Um, understanding that, you know, it's an exhibit and people are walking by, you want to sort of grab someone's, uh, you know, allow the forms to, to come through. It's actually the same pattern applied to the glass and the matte black. Uh, and you can see the textural difference between them. They both have different qualities to them. Uh, dictating that, you know, in production, it's like anything with these, you know, there would probably be many different versions that would suit many different people, as well as different patterns. What's important about the pattern is that you have more surface area on one side than the other, not that particular pattern. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting because it, it actually mirrors a lot what you're seeing in the room on the 19th century. There's a lot of cut patterns and glass because of the way they handle light. This is a completely different function but ultimately, the two do the same thing in the sense that they, they're there to elevate the experience as well as, you know, s in this case, serve a, a purpose. I'm not sure they do so in that room. But that's the difference between a 19th century designer and a 21st century designer. A 19th century designer is there to, is an artisan there to bring about a higher level of aesthetics. 21st century, uh, designers and creative thinkers are here to absolutely imbue 
um, a greater sense of responsibility to what we put out in the world. We're here to solve problems rather than just create new ones. Uh, but you know, we still ha have a responsibility to the aesthetics of things as mm -hmm. well. It's not just pure utility. Yes. Right, that's a very good question. And that is one of the things that, um, here's sort of the trajectory of additive manufacturing and why we chose to, um, to look at this uh, uh, in terms of 3D printing. Um, one, there's zero waste in the process. Nothing is made until it has a home. Like, you're not, these are not being manufactured in some far off country, put on a container ship, shipped around the world, put in a warehouse in New Jersey, and sit there and hope you sell it, and then make it the trip to the end buyer and all the impact that that has. Um, additive manufacturing allows you to, when you buy something, it's made right then and it's made for you. Um, now, the, here's the trajectory of additive manufacturing. It's been around for 37 years. It's basically following Moore's law. Like, it's been getting, it's basically following Moore's law, the same as computing. It's been getting 20 to 25% cheaper each year and 20 to 25% better in terms of quality. And while now this is, you could have these things 3D printed, they would be extraordinarily expensive. In five years' time, they would be less so. In 15 years' time, it would be cheaper than if you could mass manufacture them today. So yes, the idea that out of manufacturing, you know, Mary and I, you know, we were saying, we, we came up with our ideas fairly quickly, but then it's uh, how do we, you know, who do we, we have to partner with people, we have to figure out, you know, how are we going to have these things realized and in the space and on time and in really for the exactly. opening. That's one of the bigger challenges that, uh, that you rarely get to hear about. Yeah. The, what we tried to do, um, and if, if this has a, you know, another phase to it, um, the actual sort of like pa these like panels that you see that are like supporting the seats, um, the idea is that they would be tessellated in, um, so tessellated meaning it's cut out from the board using the negative shapes after you use the circles for the seating and the tabletops. Um, we try to stick with that, and so like um, the curvature of the tabletop kind of speaks to the um, oblong shape of Joe's um, serving wear. So that's how we kind of wanted to match that, um, just like aesthetically. But we were trying to see if we could also, you know, um, have whatever was left over after we cut the boards to serve as a uniform shape to be the seats. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they, um, they're not too much. Yeah, yeah. Could only require two different heights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this one's meant for a hot beverage and this for a cold. And it wasn't necessary to wrap it all the way around for a cold beverage. Actually, and if anything, it would, it would lose heat more quickly. So we used it, the same design aesthetic, for a grip. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just need to break things up a bit. You know. well, too many dots. Schedule. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for sticking around and and, yeah. uh, and thanks for the, the great questions. You know, yeah. worst thing you can do is be up here and no one ask anything. That's like <laughs> terrible. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs>